spit-offs from mine. Um, after the, at the first tea party held at the state capitol back 2009, I went there. I didn't have any idea what the tea party was about. I've always been a, an activist, but primarily local. City of Phoenix, uh, County of Maricopa, and uh, my own neighborhood, which is Moon Valley, which is the second largest homeowners association in the city. And, and I was the president of that uh, three times. Uh, so th that's what I was doing, you know, doing the, the local stuff. But when uh, 2001 hit, September 11th, by the way, I don't know if you know it or not, but there were, th there were two movements in Islam. Uh, the first one ended uh, with the conquering of what was called Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. The second one was stopped at the gates of Austria. And it was stopped on September the 11th, 1612. And it was the Polish army that did it. I'm half Polish. <laughs> uh, second generation. My father was a Scot, and he was settled down to keep the Spaniards from coming up from Florida. With, and we fought for the crown. And then we fought for the south. So, I've been on the wrong side of a lot of, a lot of issues. <laughs> but I think I'm on the right side now. And um, I, ha I simply had to do something. So after that rally down at the state capitol, there were a lot of pop-ups all over the place. One of them was the John Birch Society, and I went and talked to them a little bit. I heard about them because I'm, I grew up some, pretty much up in the North, uh, Midwest, in Illinois. And there's always something about Ralph I liked. I got my master's degree at Dartmouth College with Amos Tuck, uh, and I got my undergraduate at Northern Illinois University, which is, by the way, where Jim Waring went to school. I just found out. But he said, when did you go there? When did you graduate? I said, oh, 1971. Uh, I think he was about three. <laughs> uh, when he went, oh, he said, oh. <laughs> Anyhow, then I stopped at the Republican tent. And this fellow asked me if I'd like to be a PC. And I said, what's a PC? I had no clue. I, I remember Ward Committeeman out of Chicago. That's how Daly made, you know, kept that machine together. And, and basically, that's the way I do my precinct. I'm a Ward Committeeman in, in Moon Mountain, at now Moon Valley. Previously Moon Valley, then Moon Mountain, now Moon Valley again. And that is, I give them cards. This little card right here that has all my contact information on it, and I hand them all of, all of the uh, political palm cards, and I say, after the election, throw this stuff away, but keep this card. I said because I know, firstly, everybody at the state, the county, and at the city, if you got a problem, call me. What I really want them to do is call me what they want when they want to know what, who they should vote for. And that's what they do. They call me and ask me, well, Wes, what do you think? Who's, who's the best guy? Because they know I'm conservative. I've always been conservative. It's been this country first. Anyway, the first thing, so I became a PC. And the first thing I did was I went down, first Republican event was the state fair and at Hedges. And I were working the booth. This is for, uh, Ed just passed away after coming back from the uh, GOP convention. And while there was nobody around at the very beginning, we're sitting around talking, and he's trying to get where I'm coming from. Now you have to understand, I never have voted straight kick in my life up until 2010. Never. I voted like Ann. I picked this one or that one, the person I thought was the best. And so I was talking to Ed, and after about a half an hour, he looked at me kind of strange, and he said, are you sure you're a Republican? You sound more like a Libertarian. <laughs> and I am. I'm a, I'm a laissez-faire kind of guy. I think everybody should get the hell out of the way. I don't believe that we don't have to have any government, because that's, that's anarchy. If you want any go uh, no government, just become a democracy, and, and, and you'll know what you're, what you're going to get. And that'll eventually get you to uh, a dictatorship. 
Uh, so, the very funny thing about our country is we are always creating other countries. We're, we're nation builders. We've been doing it virtually since the beginning. We try to pass off to other people what we've discovered. The only problem is we have never recreated ourselves. We have never cloned ourselves. One of the reasons is the, the Fed. The Fed precludes us from doing that because of the, the method of creating money out of nothing. If you go back to the gold standard, if you go back to the uh, Bism, it was 800 years. That was gold coin and everybody knew what it was worth and it was, a, it was the medium of exchange. And guess what? For 800 years there was no inflation. Inflation is nothing more than creating more money than you have covered. If you haven't read it yet, read The Creature from Jekyll Island. Yeah, that's a classic. That's a fantastic book. Banking is simple. So anyhow, I am... Uh, one day I, uh, I decided I wanted to move our tea party into the church. I didn't think that we were doing well enough with the Christians. We have 40 million Christians that aren't even registered. That's 80 million. We got to get those Christians to register and to get them out to vote their principles. That they've been taught to believe there's a separation of church and state, which of course is a myth. You all know that, I, 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 I presume. Uh, so I moved into the church, and for the last two years I've been pushing the congregation to try to get actively involved in politics. But most of them are my age. You know, I look at them and I say, you, you're, you look much older than I am. And I guess it's because I think much younger than they do, because I'm not willing and ready to put my foot in the grave yet. i got a lot to do. And so I'm constantly moving all the time, and age doesn't mean anything to me. But what I like about Ron Paul, in fact, I, 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 you, I chaired the booth at the Republican uh, convention that was held over here in Mesa for uh, the, the uh, Republican debate. I was out there in the sun uh, greeting everybody as they were walking through. And the Ron Paul people were all out in that intersection. And I don't think there's a person in that group that was running around that was over 25. <laughs> And I thought, wow, how strange is that? Because most of the people that I'm preaching to every week for the last three years are a little bit younger than me and some older than me and a few young people, some, uh, people that I consider young enough to be my kids. My daughter just turned 50 <laughs> yesterday. And on Sunday, my wife and I celebrated our 51st wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. So that'll give you some idea how old I am. I was married when I was 13. <laughs> but my point is, it's encouraging to see people, young people, actually believing what Ron Paul has to say. I believe a lot of what he has to say, because those are libertarian values. Those are Republican values. As Ann just pointed out, it's the same stuff. It's just conservative, get the government out of the way. Now, listening to Ann and, and, and listening to uh, Anita. Anita. Anita, all kinds of things were coming through my, uh, my, my mind that I should be talking about. I could be up here for four hours just hitchhiking on what they said. But I'm here to talk about a different thing. But before I get into that, I just wanted to mention that I contracted with Shane Krauser to come to our church to give a lecture on the Constitution because we hosted, or I hosted, I should say, the um, anniversary of the Bill of Rights, December 15th. And when I started to host that, uh, the way we've done it for the last 12 years or so is somebody gets up and reads one of the bills, and then somebody else gets up and reads another bill, and we go through all, all 10 of the bills. And then we have a round table and talk about what they mean. And it's always people about my age are getting up there and talking. And I thought, gee, wouldn't it be cool if I got all the kids from the church? So I got all these kids, 
and I had a 10 year old to 17. And I sat him down the day before the, uh, the event in the front pew of the church. And I said, okay, and I hand them each a bill. And I said, this one is for you. You're going to go up on the stage when I call your name, and you're going to read it. And, I had, and they're looking at this, and they said, that, I'm looking at them. I said, you know what this is, don't you? You know what we're doing here? No. You know what the Bill of Rights are, aren't you? No. I said, woo. <laughs> is this something? So. I got Shane. I said, Shane, come to our church and give a class. And before I went to that, had him come, I went to the Deer Valley Tea Party. And I came in with, with a buddy of mine by the name of Ray Sweeney, a Marine. I hang around with Marines, but I, you know, it just makes me feel good because of the, you know what Marines are. Anyway. Um, we were 39th and 40 to enter that room. We all signed in. Everybody was eating, and I was sitting there, and I already eaten, so I wasn't doing anything, waiting for Shane to start. And I looked around that room, just so I look like I'm looking around this room, and I knew every single person in the room. They were either in our tea party at the beginning, or they come occasionally, or they're in other tea parties that I go to, East Valley, wherever. And I said, what are we doing here? Preaching We're preaching to the choir every week. It's the same people and they're groupies. Tea party people are groupies. They go from one tea party to the next tea party. I know, I know people that go to five tea party meetings a week. And a lot of them go to the Red Mountain one. Uh, you know, they get, but can you get those people out? I did get out the vote for LD6 and, and our chair was uh, David Fitzgerald. I did get out the vote in 2010. I couldn't get, every day, every time we had a meeting, I'd bring all of this literature into the PC, or into the uh, LD, lay it all out by, by uh, precinct, and then take it all home. The, pre the precinct captains wouldn't even pick up the stuff I'd sorted out for them. Call a uh, walking list, uh, palm cards. So I'd call them up on the phone, come over to my house and get this. You know, it was 50%. If I got 50% out there, that was a lot. So if the PCs aren't getting out there, and surely the Tea Party people aren't getting out there, you got the, the rule of, I, I, I hesitate to use the word 10%. Maybe that's a little bit generous. But you got 10% of the people that'll do something, and 90% sit around with their hands in their lap. Mm -hmm. And we're not making any progress. So one day I was, I was reading uh, all my emails and, and, and there was this uh, thing about YouTube. So I went to that YouTube broadcast and I saw this fellow by the name of Bob Schultz without a T. And he was standing out in a kind of wooded area and he started talking about lobbying for the Constitution. And he, he said, you know, we, we have all these uh, elected representatives. By the way, don't use the word official anymore. They are not officials. We're the officials. They're our representative. This is a republic. These people represent us. We send them to Congress to represent us. We don't send them to Congress to be officials over us. We're the officials. Try to get that word out of your vocabulary. Let's just like democracy. Don't ever use that word. <laughs> because we're not a democracy. We're a republic. Anybody that thinks that we're otherwise is a fool. But of course, the left wants you to think we're a democracy. Anyway, he says, all these people take an oath that they will defend the Constitution. None of them do. In Dallas, uh, David, what kind of something? What's his name? David Barton. Anybody know David Barton? Yeah. David Barton got up on the stage, uh, and he made probably the best characterization of why these people don't keep their oath. He says that oath that they're taking is not an oath to you and me. It's not an oath to the government. It's an oath to God. And if they don't believe in God, it means nothing. 
What does it mean to them? And that's true. So, we have for 110 years counted on them maintaining our Constitution by virtue of this oath that they've been taking. Most of them haven't even read it, as Shane will tell you. Ask them, where do you get your power? Name one thing. How many are there? They can't answer that. Most of them can't. We can because we read it. So, what do we do now? We have a school board. We have a town council. We have a city council. We have a county board of supervisors. We have a state legislature. All of the things that you guys are just arguing about with Ann, all of those are perpetuated by virtue of the fact that the people that we have elected do not adhere to the rules that we made. We created the Constitution. It's like the Torah. You can't change it without difficulty. We drew a box and we said everything inside this box you can do, everything outside that box is ours or the state. We did the same thing at the state level. The state constitutions replicate the U.S. Constitution. And we did that at the city charter level. And we did it at the school board. Yet the people that we have elected Ignore it. don't even know what's in it. Do you know that probably the only building that the city of Phoenix can own is an abattoir? How many people know what an abattoir is? Nobody else would buy it. That's a slaughterhouse. How many slaughterhouses do you think there are in Phoenix right now? None. And certainly none that the city owns. But yet they go out and they buy buildings and everything else, and of course they're using HUD as the excuse. But understand one thing. <coughs> Just because something is done that's unconstitutional, even if it was done a hundred years ago, it's still unconstitutional. A wrong is a wrong, and you, the age doesn't make it right. So we have to undo a whole lot of wrongs to get back to where our founding fathers had us. And this is what Bob Schultz was talking about. He said, so what we need, he said, Where's, you go to every state capitol, and you look over there, and you see this building with a dome on it. He says, that's where our government is doing stuff for us or to us. The latter probably more than the former. Where's the people's house? There is no people's house. So it's his idea that in each of the 50 states, we set up a people's house. And one of the clones we're going to use, or one thing we're going to clone, I should say, is the Goldwater Institute. Goldwater Institute is comprised of constitutional lawyers. <clears throat> By the way, they don't even teach that in law school anymore. Um, we need to have lawyers in a place like the Goldwater Institute that will take these violations of the Constitution or the Charter and fight for them. And there's one provision that I'll talk about here in a minute. In the, in the Bill of Rights, that gives us a bloodless sword to fight our government. And it's, in the, it's the last sentence in the First Amendment. And it's our right to petition our government for redress. Do you know that every section of that particular amendment has been decided by the Supreme Court multiple times except that one, not one case of redress? And redress goes all the way back to the Magna Carta. That's when it was established. And of course our founding fathers knew that because they were looking at those documents going all the way back to the Greeks and all the republics. That's why we have a republic. And so they put that in there and that was, that was their way of providing us with a sword with which to fight our government if they stepped out of line. Now, when I believe it was James... Uh, signed the Magna Carta, he basically said, you have the right to petition this crown for redress on anything that we do that you don't think is right. And we have 40 days with which to answer that. And we can't just answer it like you see the courts answering things like you don't have status or standing. They have to give you facts and figures 
as to why you're wrong and they're right. They just can't dismiss it. And he says, if you don't do that, I mean, if I don't do that, you can take my, my castles, you can take my money, and you can take my kingdom. That's how strong that particular facet was in the Magna Carta. And it's, just, it's that strong in our Constitution, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. This is totally nonpartisan. You can't, you can't get into politics when you start looking at the Constitution. It is either right or it's wrong. And that's the only thing it is. It's not anywhere in the middle. It's black or white. And as a result, you eliminate those little arguments that you just had. Because if it's constitutional... Well, no, no. But I mean, it's a healthy thing. Arguing is healthy. Uh, but if it's in the Constitution, and it says, look, we can do this. Uh, John Shattuck was my uh, representative for many years and happens to be a neighbor of mine. And John Shattuck in 94, when he went to Congress, the first thing he did was come up with a bill which, which he called the Enabling Law. And that basically, they, our, our House has just now finally done it after all these years. And that basically says, where in the Constitution does it say you can do what you're proposing to do in this bill? And if you can't answer that question, the bill can't be, can't move forward. It's got to be killed right there. Well, of course, Obamacare, yeah. where in the Constitution can you find that? Covered. It's not there. And, they, and, and the Supreme Court, the one place, the one place that they did put it was in the interstate or Commerce Clause, the Commerce Clause. But the Supreme Court said, it's not the Commerce Clause. By the by. We have already drafted a petition for redress, which we will be issuing soon, uh, to Chief Justice Roberts. Because Chief Justice Roberts made a very critical mistake in his ruling. And I read this thing and I didn't even pick up on it. He called a, ta a direct tax an indirect tax, and then he called it a direct tax again. Now, the only time in the Constitution where taxes are referred to more than, where anything is referred to more than once is on taxes. The founding fathers were very concerned about taxes, so they said it more than once in two different ways on what you can and what you cannot do in, in the form of tax. And one of those things, on a direct tax, has to be apportioned by state. So in theory, if Arizona is 20% of the country, then 20% of the taxes, direct taxes, have to come from Arizona, 30% or 40% from California, and so on. Okay, so he calls the tax an indirect tax, because of course you can't apportion a fine. As in essence, that's what it is, the Obama uh, thing. So if you can't apportion the fine, then it has to be an indirect tax. The only problem is, where is that tax recorded? On your 1040. And what's your 1040? It's a tax on your income. To tax income is to tax property. The Supreme Court has ruled numerous times that income is property. You know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was originally the pursuit of property. We're talking about property here. And property is the fundamental right that keeps us free. That's why we've got to do away with, corp uh, with, uh, with property tax. Uh, if I could just, I'll just uh, switch on that in just a minute. My tax bill came up again. It's gone up three years in a row. 50%, 22%, and now 8%. Every single one of those increases was due to what? School districts. What? School districts. School. Right. And I, I was really looking at this, and, and Washington Elementary School District, which is what I live in, among the other two, the community college and the high school, wants to pass a override. For what? So every kid in, in school can have an iPad. I beg your pardon? I don't have an iPad. <laughs> My antiquated machine here barely works. 
Uh, I can't afford one because I'm paying the taxes to Washington School District. But the, the point I'm going to raise here is my tax bill is 83% for school districts. Yes, it is. So what would be wrong? Now, if I don't pay that, guess how long I'll keep my house? Not long. Not long. I'm just, I'm just renting it from the government, basically. Priority. It's not mine, <laughs> even though I had to pay for it, and I have to keep it up, and I have to mow the grass, and I have to paint it, and, and, and make all the repairs. Then the government just walks away and takes it for nothing, and, or next to nothing. What would be wrong with uh, the school boards issuing to every man, woman, and child a tax bill just like we get on our car? You open it up, it says, oh, yeah, you've got to renew your license plate. So much of this is a tax. Let's face it, it's a tax. And, and we pay it, right? We don't quibble. But, you know, the problem is we, we miss all the renters with this property tax because that's not a portion, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm a financial executive, so I, I was a CFO of a Fortune 50 company. So I, I, I think in dollars and cents and, and numbers. And... If we then did that, then the city of Phoenix could do the same. And there's a, I mean, there's a little, there's 10%, less than 10%, and the county is the other 8%. So we'd get three, four bills a year. There'd be no tax on your property. And boy, when you got that bill, would you start thinking about bond issues. Yep. That's right. When the school wanted more money, when they can't live within their budget, but you have to. Yep. And where's that money come from? Yesterday I went to a planning session for the city of Phoenix and we're, we're doing a 10-year plan and all these people got up, there weren't that many, there's only 20 people. Oh. All of them got up and they were talking about, they had a brainstorming on all these things that we want Phoenix to look like. Every single item they had cost a fortune. I want more parks. I want more swimming pools. I want more libraries. I want more, I want more, I want more. And I stood up and I said, where do you think the money for this is going to come from? We can't pay for what we have right now. Let's start thinking about something fiscally responsible here that we can actually do. And that just right over the top. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm here to do is to recruit. I'll give you an analogy. A rocket ship, when it's on the launching pad, it has all this fuel in it. We ignite the fuel, that explodes and it blows down and for every action there's a reaction. So the rocket lifts off because it goes through a small orifice at the bottom. Now if you drill holes around the side, all of that energy is going to go out in all directions. And guess what? The rocket ship's going to stay right on the path. That's the tea party. That's most of us. We're shooting in all directions. Yep. We're like, we've got shotguns, and we're just blasting away, and we're hitting nothing. How many Tea Party people did we elect last, even this last primary? I can, I can name one, Michelle Regenti, she's the only one I know. She happens to be my discovery, but, <laughs> in Congress, <laughs> but, but, but that is the only one that I really know that began as a Tea Party person, and we rose her right out and put her up and elected her. We supported her. We supported her and we supported her with our talent, our time, and our treasure. That's what you have to do to get people elected. That's what the Tea Party should be doing. They should be doing the vetting. I heard that a little bit ago. We've got to go find people that, that believe like we do so that they will vote our values. By the way, we have the most um, favorable votes in this last Congress for uh, against abortion than since Ray B. Ward. That's because Roe v. Wade, yeah, so I think. That's because we elected people who thought like us. And so they are going to vote like us. That's what our representatives are supposed to do. They're supposed to reflect who we are. So we have to find the people like Ron Paul. You like Ron Paul? I like everything Ron Paul says. Unfortunately, he's been, he's been preaching to the, to the wrong people for a long, long time, and, and he's gotten a reputation of being some of a kook. But that doesn't mean he's wrong. I'm not saying he's a kook. I'm saying that was his reputation. Um, in any case, he is right. 
and all the other guys are wrong. And I think that uh, Rob, uh, Mitt should appoint him as the chair of the Fed today. If he did that, the Fed would be gone. We've got to get rid of it. But anyway, back to, back to my issue here. So if we're blowing out in all directions, we're not accomplishing anything. The, the issue of uh, what's going on in Gilbert, where we're talking about just that one city council, and everybody's concentrating on that one city council and worrying about what that one organization is doing, they actually made a change. They affected a change. And that's what this is all about. This is to set up a group of people who will monitor each level of government. And I'm recruiting now. I'm looking for people who will do this. Uh, we'll watch each level of government and ascertain whether or not what they are proposing to do is in fact legal under the document that we've defined for them. And we've said, look, this is all you can do. If you can't do it, then we would petition for redress, in other words, to undo what you have done. And if they don't do that, then it's court. That's why you need the lawyers. And so I will turn the lights off here and I'll blow right through this real quick. Hopefully you can see it. Can you see that? Okay, this is, this is the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint that was put together for the people of New York. This whole movement started in New York. And basically it's we the people